Uh-huh. Good morning, everyone. We're just going to let people kind of filter in here. Good morning, good morning, or good afternoon, depending on where you are. Get Muffin in there. <laughs> and Maisie. There she is. Hi, girl. <laughs> Hey. <laughs> yeah, Patricia, this is how we started the last one was Muffin as co-host. He's uh, always. <laughs> he insists. He insists. <laughs> He's earned it. Little buddy. Little buddy. Patricia, okay. do you have animals? I do. I have a dog. A dog <laughs> named Mia. Uh, I love yeah. it. My girl Maisie's back here. Um. Okay, shall we start, guys? What do you think? Yeah, yeah. Let's get started, BJ. Why don't you go ahead? Okay. Hi. Hello, everybody. Um, very happy to be back. You know, we love these thingies. Um, so today, today is gonna be fun. Um, we have our friend Patricia here with us, who's gonna help us dig into communication, a subject we've talked about on these webinars before, but not with a speech speech language pathologist. And not in, in any way that we're going about to about to talk about communication. I mean, it's sort of the uber subject. Everything comes, so much comes down to communication. And there's so much to it, which we're about to discover with Patricia. Um, but reminder for those of us who may be your first time here, um, these things, this is meant to be safe, uh, holy ground here. And by that, I mean, just a safe place to think and feel, ask questions, just listen. It's a place for really there's no real rules except for kindness uh, and basic respect, you know, basic moral stuff. But otherwise, please let it rip. And I know a lot of you out there may just want to listen, and that's cool too. But these are meant to be interactive. We'll kind of do our little level setting slide run. Um, and then we'll cut and cut to the conversation. And that's where so much of the fun is. So please don't hold back. I think I speak for Patricia and I say there are there are no dumb questions or no, anything goes whether we have an answer we'll see but um, and then if we don't get to all the questions and as we do we'll at the by the end of the hour we'll uh, we'll record answers and put them up uh, with the recording afterwards so um, yeah so I think that's about the gist of my comments let me cut over to Sonia. Let's, um, Patricia, would you mind just introducing oh, yourself? Oh, yeah, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> sure thing. So my name is Patricia Liu, uh, and I am a speech language pathologist. Uh, sometimes people refer to us as speech therapists. Uh, and what that means is that we help with communication. Um, I work with adults, and I've worked across a range of settings, helping people with chronic conditions that might be impacting their ability to communicate, and also in the hospital, too. Um, helping people with troubleshooting communication so that they're able to, to make their needs known. Um, so today we'll be talking a little bit more about kind of the, the fundamentals of communication and what happens when somebody has trouble with the basics and, and what we can do about that. Awesome. Thank you, Patricia. Okay, Sonia, over to you. Okay. Um, morning again. Thanks everyone for being here. So um, after Patricia and BJ have kind of gone through the level setting portion of the slides, we will open it up to questions from you. And there's two ways you can do this. You can raise your hands and we'll unmute you and you can ask it out loud and, you know, maybe have a bit of a dialogue. Or if you would prefer to not do that, you can just type it into the Q&A and I will read it aloud for you and get it answered that way. Um, again, to BJ's point about safe space, if you want to remain anonymous and have us not say your name, that's totally fine. Just let us know in the Q&A and we'll make sure to respect that. Um, so again, you can raise your hand or you can type in the question um, and we will get those answered uh, so in whatever way feels best for you. Thanks again for being here. Beautiful. Okay, guys. And uh, uh, also always a shout out to Sonia and for the beautiful imagery on the slides um, as ever. Okay, Patricia, over to you, my friend. All right, so what is communication? You know, when we really break it down, we're thinking about getting information from some one brain to another brain, right? So we're, we're starting with our thoughts, we're converting that to language, 
And then we're converting those words into movement in our bodies. You know, we might move our, our mouth to speak. We might use our hands to write or to text or to type. Um, there's other nonverbal means of communication where we might express a lot, plenty with our facial gestures um, or be able to point to things in the room that we need. Um, so really on a fundamental level, we're really thinking about getting communication from one person to another, okay? Um, communication is so crucial for helping us to have control over our environment, um, making our basic needs known. Um, and for people who are having trouble with communi communication, that can even impact uh, their ability to maintain their own safety and let people know what they need, especially for those who are uh, dealing with a chronic condition uh, that, that maybe makes it hard for them to care for themselves and they have to alert others to, to what they're feeling and needing. Um, on another really fundamental level, it's so crucial for us to be able to communicate effectively in order to connect with others, which is really kind of a basic human need. Um, we need to be able to express our emotions and be able to communicate to maintain our relationship and engage with the world around us. Yeah. I can move on to the next slide whenever. Yes. Yep, Please. shall we? Okay. All right. And as you can imagine, communication is so varied depending on context, you know, starting with the people that we're communicating with. Our friends and families and caregivers, people who know us well, you know, often that's the easiest, right? We have a ton of shared context. We know each other well. We know uh, the topics of conversation we usually like to talk about. We understand each other's daily routines and maybe their needs. Um, so that sometimes is easier. You know, for a lot of the people that I'm working with who might have speech problems, their friends and family and caregivers are the ones who probably can understand their speech the best um, and communicate with them the most efficiently. Um, things get maybe a little bit trickier when we're broadening our circle and we're, we're engaging with people who are not as familiar with us. And maybe there's technical things that we need to get through, you know, talking with your doctors, your nurses, uh, your therapists who you don't know well, um, navigating insurance, figuring out uh, medications with your pharmacist. You know, this is where the complexity of what needs to be communicated um, along with the, the time pressure and the time demands uh, and your unfamiliarity with the other people might really add additional barriers uh, and make things more challenging there. You know, so in thinking about the different ways and different contexts that you might be communicating in, we might talk about some ideas today on how you can better prepare for these situations mm. um, so that you can come in with more control and be able to, to get that information to the other person that, that you really need them to know better. You know, right on. And it also, I look at this slide and I see that who, and I also think, yeah, with whom are you communicating, right? Obviously, big one, different language, different material, different information. It feels very different to speak with someone on technical terms versus sort of more poetic terms or whatever else. There's a lot of nuance involved. There's a lot involved. But I also see this slide, Patricia, as, and I wonder, I guess maybe I don't want to get too ahead of, far ahead of ourselves. We'll get to this. But I see this as a sort of also a nod to identity. Sort of, you know, I meet not infrequently, I meet, people who say, well, what can I no longer, when I can no longer communicate, then I'm done. I mean, so much of their sense of, of life, of identity hinges on this act of communication. As you say, an act of connection. It's one of the big ones where people feel like life is either worth living or isn't. So it's big, big stuff. It gets at our identity. Um, so just want to note that too. I'm sure you've seen a lot of folks Yes. whose mood <laughs> varies wildly depending on their ability to communicate. A hundred percent. You know, I do the bulk of my work uh, these days in an ALS clinic, mm -hmm. uh, which is a terminal disease um, where people are often making big decisions about uh, when they want to prolong their life. 
And a really common thing that comes up is when I can no longer communicate, you know, that's, that's what is going to make my life worth living or not living. Yeah. Um, so, you know, communication a hundred percent, so crucial. Yeah. And as we'll, we'll get into it too, but that, that note of when I can communicate, when I can no longer communicate, I'm done. Um, well, there's huge gray zone in there. There are ultimate, there are all sorts of different ways to communicate. There are assistive devices. We'll get to that. I'm getting ahead of myself, but in other words, our jobs our conversations don't end with someone saying that they want to live or not want to live around communication, because then we can dig in and explore how we might communicate. Um, that's where your work, or one of the ways your work gets so beautiful and profound. Um, okay, let me, let me keep us rolling on the slides here. So back to some of the mechanics with you, sorry. Yeah. All right, so we're often thinking about how we can get information out right, when somebody's having a communication difficulty. But I think a huge piece of the puzzle that we need to think about is getting the information in. If somebody is having trouble hearing or seeing, um, being able to read the words on the page, hear the words that are being spoken to them, you know, read the facial expressions in the room, that might impact their ability to comprehend, you know, what's being asked of them. Um, if somebody is having difficulty processing language in their brain or thinking clearly, you know, being able to concentrate and pay attention, you know, that might also impact how somebody is able to, to comprehend the situation, follow the conversation, and often at a very fundamental level, even being able to give you a yes, no response that's reliable. And really that reflects, hey, I understood your question and yes, this is what I want or no, this is not what I want. Mm -hmm. You know, so when we are um, engaging uh, with people who maybe are having trouble communication, communicating, it's really important for us to get a sense for how much of the information is getting in and maybe how we can tailor our approach to help to support that too. This comes up a lot in, in my in, in folks that I've ever seen with strokes, right? There are you know, various parts of neuroanatomy that can be affected by a stroke, for example, that can affect someone may be able to take in information just perfectly fine, but not be able to communicate outwardly, externally. Um, and it can go the other direction. They may not be able to receive that information, but the mechanics of articulating themselves are fine. And so it's, it gets very, I'll just say just from, it's it gets, um, it's a it's a window into sort of our nervous system and how we're wired when the communication and when you take out little pieces of that highway you see different effects and and then just just to for apropos nothing in particular just see, working with folks who have, have had various strokes you get a real sense of just how exquisite communication is and how mechanical it is too including receiving things so anyway, just again, apropos nothing, but it's just been fascinating for me as a generalist to see that play out in people's lives. Yes, yes. Being able to piece together all the, the bits and pieces and maybe where some breakdowns are happening, where we've got some other strengths that are compensating, you know, mm -hmm. that that can be really helpful uh, yeah. to help help with the day to day. And for each point along the pathway of taking information, uh, synthesizing it you know, responding to it and then actually articulating, there's, there's, there are things that can be done all along the way, all along, the, at, at every link of that chain. Um, yeah. Exactly. So, okay. So shall I, uh, let me. Yeah. Let's talk a little bit about getting information out then. Yes. Yes. Okay. So getting information out, we're starting with the thoughts in our head. Um, Again, this requires us to be able to think clearly as well. You know, can we formulate a thought and have the intent to get it to somebody else uh, and initiate um, our pathway for getting that thought out? You know, often what, what happens in our brain is that thought gets trans translated into actual language, actual words uh, that we might then deliver to our mouth and make movements of our mouth so that we can speak. Um, we might also deliver that information to our hands so that we can write or type or text our messages or maybe point. 
Mm -hmm. um, again, if there is a breakdown at any part in this pathway, that might make things more challenging. And sometimes people are dealing with multiple issues at the same time. You know, a stroke can impact our ability to think clearly and efficiently. It can impact our ability to process language. It can impact our ability to move our body um, efficiently and, and easily. Mm -hmm. And so it sometimes things are quite challenging um, for people who have breakdowns, let's say on multiple points in the path. Um, but really, you know, part of what uh, we help with with communication is helping people to get creative. Hmm. You know, how can we communicate our thought by any means possible and, you know, pulling from many different tools in our toolbox and really kind of sharpening those other tools um, that, that we can tap into. Is that where your work gets, well, you just use this beautiful word creative. Uh, as much as we talk about the, this as a mechanistic like an apparatus, a machinery for communication. There is, there's a lot, well, again, I'm getting ahead of ourselves. We'll cut to some of the uh, adaptive tools, but do you get to feel, Patricia, in, in your own work, working with folks, does it get to feel very creative and how people find ways to express themselves one way or another? Yes, it certainly does. That is the funnest part of my job, I will say. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, and you never really, you know, everybody's different what they want to communicate and how they want to connect with people might might vary from one person to another. Um, and the tools that we're able to tap into certainly are going to vary from one person to another. But when you really are able to make that connection, when somebody feels like, hey, I've gotten this information out and somebody else has picked that up and received it, that's, that's really, you know, one of the most meaningful parts of my job. Well, just why I love how you define that, because it's not Communication isn't necessarily about phonation or pronunciation or even words. I mean, if you're to back up, just like you're saying, to say the idea, what we're talking about here is moving a thought from me to a thought in you. Like, you know, some there's some uh, transfer, there's, a, there's movement. And words are amazing, but they're not everything, are they? I mean, it's just a piece of the puzzle. Um, Certainly, yes. Yeah. So much is communicated, let's say, in a laugh or a smile. Um, you know, we we really want to think about communication as a whole and, and not necessarily just the nitty gritty details of if we pronounce that S right, right. Um, or if we were able to spell a word right. Right. Yeah. Right. Or some flowery command of language it can be beautiful, but just one way of a zillion ways to to transfer one a thought from one person to another, or even a feeling, I guess it's not even just thought, yeah. but that's why I love, I love your grounding communication in connection. That's, that's so much the nut. Um, it seems ah, beautiful. Okay. Let me keep us rolling. Ah, it's a good one. Oh my goodness. Yes. Mm -hmm. I will say that, uh, in working with people who often have really profound difficulty communicating, we deal with a lot of silence. Um, and this can be uncomfortable uh, for any of us, all of us. Um, and I will add another layer to this. I think in addition to the silence, uh, we're often dealing with situations where maybe there isn't a great solution. And you know we're dealing with situations where yes, communication is incredibly challenging and frustrating and the messages aren't being delivered. And part of that is just kind of accepting uh, sometimes that, that things will be challenging mm -hmm. and then that there will be silence. Mm -hmm. But it does also give us an opportunity to kind of step back and, and allow for some space and really allow ourselves to uh, be able to observe what's needed and, and perhaps to even become better listeners too. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's fascinating. And folks you work with, you know, I, as a sort of a general truism, maybe like when one skill or capacity is, of, is down or affected, we find workarounds. We, we, if something's diminished in us, we grow something else for lack of better communication um so you know do you do you 
do you see people, um, I guess this gets back to the creative work that you're mentioning, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and it sort of sort of sounds like silence too, it's not the absence of communication, silence is itself a form of communication or it allows for other forms of communication to bubble up, gestures, emotions, a tear, whatever else. So yeah, so I gather you will work with silence just as you're working with language one way or another. Exactly, yeah. We, we in, in dealing with, with changes to communication, you know, we are going to need to think about how we're gonna be adapting. And sometimes it takes those moments of silence uh, to give us a better idea of maybe how to go about that. Yeah. Yeah. And do you find that folks you work with who are, and I guess this is where I started going a moment ago, is who are have challenges communicating, mm -hmm. do those folks tend to be extra good listeners? Is there some sort of, is there something in there that, yeah, do you see people developing their listening skills even further when they're challenged to communicate? Or is that, am I just looking for a tidy story? Oh, I think that uh, that is an interesting hypothesis. Mm -hmm. I can't say that, I would say that that listening, getting better at, at taking information in is a skill that we can all cultivate hey. and hey, get hey, better hey. at. Yeah, yeah. Hey, amen. <laughs> that is to land, that is for darn sure. <laughs> um, right on. Okay. Anything else you want to say here, Patricia, or shall we keep moving? I think we can keep moving. All right, Mama. Let's see here. Okay. All right. So here is just a, a simple list of tools, definitely not exhaustive, um, that maybe sometimes we can tap into if we're having trouble with communication. A lot of them are kind of common sense, uh, really simple tools. First one being amplification, right? If uh, you're having trouble hearing, you might use hearing aids. There are uh, over-the-counter amp personal amplifiers called pocket talkers that might make it easier for someone to hear. Um, so often this is overlooked, uh, especially when we're in the hospital, we're having uh, really kind of complex conversations in noisy environments. We need to make sure that the person at a fundamental level can hear us clearly hmm. um, to be able to start to get that message across. You know, conversely, uh, I work with a lot of people who maybe have trouble breathing and don't have great breath support for talking. And so um, we're dealing with low volumes in their voice, or maybe they're using breathing machines uh, like non-invasive ventilation like a BiPAP or a CPAP, and it's hard to hear them over a mask. Mm -hmm. You might consider a voice amplifier. Mm -hmm. um, these are pretty inexpensive tools that make it easy for you to be heard uh, if you're having trouble with volume in your voice, okay? You know, you mentioned something, sorry, did I just cut you off? Oh no, go ahead. Well, it's interesting that it, uh, you mentioned a moment ago, it's sort of like, yeah, there are these tools or these things that we can do in our to help us communicate per se, but a big one is setting the atmosphere around the encounter. Like yes. you're saying, I, I'm sorry, you mentioned this. I just hadn't thought about this when we were looking at the list earlier. So tending, making sure that the environment is calm or quiet for some folks. So subtle things can be transmitted perhaps. So anxiety doesn't gum up the works too. I'd imagine anxiety is a big, often, uh, uh, well, let me just ask you, does anxiety get in the way much of the time? Huge, huge. Um, you know, the ironic thing, and I'm sure we've all experienced this, right? Um, is that let's say for somebody with a language problem, like aphasia, where things are already challenging uh, for, to get their thoughts into to words and get those out. When we're in more intense situations, let's say, a group conversation where there's lots of people talking at a time and things are going quickly. Um, or we're, we're talking about um, pretty important topics of conversation. Um, that anxiety can make it that much harder mm -hmm. to get our thoughts out in the way that we want to. Mm -hmm. um, so as much as possible, if we are able to anticipate situations that might trigger anxiety, maybe thinking about how we can 
manage our environment or prepare better for that conversation so that we're in a more comfortable place. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I guess that, right. Of course, and just some thinking of time, just a simple example with my grandparents when they were around and not hearing so well, it meant not going to loud restaurants as a rule, just, just sort of injecting a, a moment of pause to think about the environment we're placing ourselves into. That can make a huge difference. Um, yeah. I've watched my own sort of trying to do speaking stuff and watch what anxiety does to my brain. I, uh, I don't, maybe it's a different talk of what the anatomy of anxiety's effect on communication is, what's getting blocked in there, but boy, have I felt that. Um, one other question, Patricia, on this sort of uh, adaptive equipment, how, how uh, dynamic is that field? Are new gizmos coming out all the time? Is there, how, how often is, how hot is that market? Yes. Uh, so there are certainly a range of fancy high-tech devices uh, that, that we might use to augment our communication. Mm -hmm. um, this might range from, let's say, a tablet device with eye gaze capabilities for somebody with very limited movement where they're able to look at a keyboard on the screen to spell messages and have that be delivered into speech. Mm -hmm. um, another example of maybe a high-tech device might be uh, for somebody with Parkinson's who has difficulty speaking uh, big and loud. Mm -hmm. uh, there, there has been a device developed that delivers uh, feedback into their ear to trick them trick their brain into uh, forming speech that's bigger and louder. You know, there's a huge range of speech devices. There's also um, a lot of research going on looking into how we can tap into the brain directly for people with very limited movement to potentially uh, translate their thoughts mm -hmm. into language or communication in one way or another. So know that you know we are living in a very exciting time, and and uh, there's a lot of development out there for tools and devices that maybe could help us to communicate or help our loved ones communicate if they're having trouble. Is there a place, Patricia? And we have we'll put out a little sort of resource page, mm -hmm. uh, you know. But while we're talking, is there is there a site or two or three where you can keep an eye on the latest greatest gizmos, or is it all over the place? Mm, I, I would say that it is all over the place, but um, I'll be sure to to share a list of references if there's any cool. in particular. Yeah. Great, 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 great. Thank you. That's yeah. lovely. Does, do you find yourself one way or another engaging with sign language per se? Does that come up in your work? Is You know, I have a lot of people ask me about whether it might be fruitful for them to learn sign language, uh -huh. um, especially if they are dealing with a condition that impacts their ability to move their mouths. Uh -huh. um, and to that, I often will respond that that it can be helpful, uh, but know that, that it's going to be limited to other people who also know sign language. Yeah. Um, and, you know, if you've got good use of your hands, you know, real easy ways to get your thoughts across uh, might be just simple pen and paper, writing mm -hmm. things down. Mm -hmm. um, there is a lot of free or low cost communication apps that we can download onto our smartphones um, that might allow us to type in what we say and have mm -hmm. that text be read aloud. Um, you know, we've got a lot of, of power just in our pockets these days in our smartphones and a lot of different options for communication apps that might support people who have difficulty speaking because of physical problems or difficulty communicating because of difficulty with language or thinking as well. Gotcha. Yeah. And one, well, let me see, what is our next slide here? Um, um, well, what was I going to say about that? Shoot, I had a Oh, come on, brain. Well, well, we'll see if that thought comes back. There was something else I wanted to ask. I do want to make a quick plug, though. I know we're oh, talking yeah, a right. lot about high tech and gadgets, but I really want to stress, too, that that, you know, we don't necessarily need lots of fancy bells and whistles. Um, you know, things like pen and paper, 
-hmm. really basic uh, communication boards sometimes, or even like pointing devices that help us to point to, to, to things in the room or letters on a board. Some of these low tech things will do the job even better, I would say, mm -hmm. in many contexts and more efficiently uh, than, than a lot of these high tech devices with a lot of bells and whistles. Um, so it's important to have a lot of tools in our toolkit uh, and know that that technology isn't necessarily for everyone and it doesn't necessarily do the best job in every situation. Amen. I like that message too. Um, oh, I remember what I wanted to ask you. Um, just in terms of art, you mentioned the word aphasia. A lot of people listening will know what that means, but can you define sort of the... Can you help us just note some of the medical lingo that people may hear uh, related to communication? Sure. Um, so aphasia is one example of a communication problem that arises out of a, a change in the brain. Um, aphasia specifically means that your brain is having trouble processing language in and of itself. Um, so a lot of the times, the, the way that I like to um, kind of a, a metaphor that I like to use is that, you know, imagine if this person with aphasia is just speaking a completely different language than you. Um, that's one way to maybe think about uh, how you might approach communicating with a person with aphasia. Mm -hmm. um, aphasia in and of itself, it's a very heterogeneous condition. So, you know, people might range in severity from a very mild problem where, oh, sometimes it's hard for them to think of the word that they want to say, um, to a very severe problem, or maybe it's really difficult for them to understand any words coming in or able to get out any real meaningful words as well. Mm -hmm. um, there are other conditions that might impact our ability to think and formulate thoughts and communicate them. Um, things like dementia. Um, mm -hmm. Sometimes dementia can cause problems with language and aphasia as well. Mm -hmm. um, and then there are also uh, problems that impact our ability to move our body. Um, so Parkinson's disease is a great example of one uh, where your speech might be impacted because the way that your brain is programming, the way that your body moves is, is changing. Mm. Um, ALS is another great example of a way that, that the movements of your body might be profoundly impacted uh, if your bodies and your muscles are becoming weaker and it's more difficult to formulate sounds and speech. Another thing maybe that, that is helpful to think about too are um, situations that might happen acutely. And let's say when somebody is hospitalized. Hmm. So often when uh, people are hospitalized and let's say they're having trouble breathing and need help from a ventilator, uh, they might become intubated where a tube is inserted into the mouth and throat and makes it so that somebody is unable to voice um, and unable to speak to communicate. Uh, and, and that might be a situation that, that you might be acutely dealing with mm -hmm. at some point. Um, in the hospital, it's also very easy to become confused. Uh, there's a word for this called delirium. Um, where somebody might acutely not be thinking straight um, because of all the changes to their sleep schedules and the medications that they're getting. Um, so it's important to also take that into consideration when you're communicating, let's say, with your loved one who is who was hospitalized. Mm. Um, and by the way, guys out there, delirium in the hospitals is extremely common, way more common than people think it is. I mean, I've seen some studies in ICUs, it's like, up to a third or a half of patients. Um, so very, very common uh, and not, not a sign that someone's quote unquote going crazy. It's what a hospital can do to us when we're sick. Um, so just a little side note there. Yeah. And mm -hmm. so another tidbit and takeaway for you all is that let's say you have a loved one or you are in the hospital and, and uh, you're having trouble with communicating you could potentially ask your doctors whether a consult to a speech language pathologist could be helpful to troubleshoot. You know, that person might come in and help to, to identify where the breakdowns are happening and maybe try out some simple tools to make communicating easier. Um, 
as you might imagine, it's so important uh, for people to be able to communicate in the hospital. You know, there are uh, crucial symptoms that we need to track. We need to help to to reduce medical errors. Um, So that's another tool that you can tap into. And in general, while we're on that note, do ideally the physician, the medical team, to think that maybe speech language pathologists would be useful here. So I, I, I can't remember a time when a patient per se requested speech language pathology, but why not, right? I mean, um, is that, should we encourage folks um, when they're in the hospital or when in a medical setting to, con- or when should we consider that, when should we encourage patients and families to at least inquire about speech language pathology? I think that if you feel like your loved one is not meeting their potential, that there are more thoughts that they could communicate that they maybe physically can't while they're in the hospital, you could ask about about the possibility of a of a speech language pathology consult. You know, uh, the doctors that they're moving with lot, they're dealing with lots of different parts, uh, and they are. Uh, concerned often with with very kind of important, basic, life-preserving interventions. Um, And it's helpful, uh, I think, for you to advocate uh, for any other services that you think might be helpful to to, uh, to, to address, you know, important issues that maybe are pretty easily overlooked, especially in somebody who's having difficulty communicating. That's right. Yeah. Especially in ICU settings where intubation and communication is just sort of presumed to be interrupted. Mm-hmm. It doesn't mean there's nothing that can be done about it. Um, but while we're on it, I know I know the topic here is communication, but I also think it's really helpful to that people understand your field. And while a lot of your focus is around communication, there are other moments speech language pathologists get involved. For example, when there's dysfunction around the sw- ability to swallow, for example. So anything else while we're on that, while we're on sort of on a tangent about your bigger work here, besides communication, any other times where we should be thinking about your discipline? Yeah, certainly. So speech language pathologists that work with adults, I would say probably a good majority, uh, a a good bulk of the work that we do often deals with swallowing. Um, So, you know, if somebody is having trouble with swallowing to uh, where it's impacting their ability to take in adequate nutrition, hydration, um, where it's becoming uncomfortable, um, or where it is potentially contributing to other adverse outcomes, things like pneumonia or, or choking. That's something that a speech language pathologist can help with as well. Gotcha. That's really helpful. I mean, in general, guys, you know, it's a very crowded highly important part of our bodies a lot of blood moving through here our vocal cords there's that bifurcation where you either go down into your lung or you go down into your stomach and it's really exquisitely coordinated zone so it's not hard to mess with it um so just to note that's this there's a lot of action in here guys um while we while we should be careful where we stick our necks out exactly. um, okay um, shall I, shall I, shall I move on, Patricia? Yes, please. All right. I think if there's one thing that anybody takes away today is, uh, the fact that if communication is impacted in any way, it's going to be slower. And I think the best thing that we all can do is slow down is slow down our pace. I think as a rule of thumb in general, we could all probably <laughs> slow down a little bit more to help us to be better listeners and to respond more effectively uh, in conversations, but slowing down is, is, is really helpful. You know, a lot of people who are dealing with chronic or progressive conditions that are impacting their ability to speak, they, they share with me that uh, they're often left out of conversations. It's mm-hmm. hard to get a word in uh, in the first place. And it's hard for other people to give them enough time to finish their thoughts. Um, you know, slowing down is, is really crucial. And, and we also really want to think about how communication is a two-way street too. Mm-hmm. So, you know, the onus does not lie on the affected person. 
we all, and that that person's communication partners can get better at communicating as well. Um, for instance, someone with aphasia, depending on who they're talking to, if they're talking to somebody who's really taken the time to develop their skills, they're probably going to be able to get a lot more information that's meaningful um, out of that person with aphasia than maybe somebody who, who isn't as familiar. Hmm. Um, so, you know, we can think about how we all can help our loved ones with difficulty communicating. Um, and if you're the person with difficulty communicating, sometimes it can be incredibly helpful for the people around you if you let them know exactly what you need from them, you know? Um, if you are able to let them know, hey, I just need a little bit of extra time to get my thoughts out. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, for this meeting, let's, let's meet one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, that makes it easier. Or I'd prefer it if you talk directly to me instead of asking my spouse these questions because I can let you know myself. Um, or even, you know, email is a great way for me to respond. Uh, I like to, to prepare my responses in advance. Mm -hmm. um, so a lot of times what I will encourage people to do, especially in preparation for their doctor's appointments, mm -hmm. write down a summary in advance. You know, if you need to sit down with, with your caregiver to help you with that, right, uh, write down your questions, write down a summary of what's been going on with you and your symptoms. Um, that way you can save time. I know everybody's crunched for time. Uh, save your energy because these kinds of conversations can be incredibly fatiguing. And then I think most importantly, it gives you more control mm -hmm. over what's being discussed so that, so that what uh, what you want to discuss is going to be addressed. Right on. Yeah. This sort of reminds me too. It's sort of a, one of the themes for us at Mental Health, Patricia, is you know, is trying to trying to kind of help cultivate a world where you don't feel the need to try to pass. You know, try to pretend that you're someone that you're not, or vice versa. <laughs> um, you know, and so what you're pointing us to here, besides again the mechanisms is sort of an activism, an advocacy, a self-advocacy or for a family member. Um, seems really, really important, um, not only for the utility of sort of conveying your point and hearing and being engaged with the world in and around you, obviously super important, um, but for all of us to absorb uh, this message here that this is create this is creative enterprise and that what works for one of us may not work for the other. Never mind the con the construct of disease in the background. There's a range of how we communicate all the time. And so what I also hear you saying is to be to remember for us to remember that the point is connection and conveyance, not just a utilitarian mode of word transmission. I hear you asking us to sort of embrace our differences here and ad advocate for ourselves and each other around communication because it's such a key way of participating in life like we started our talk. I mean, it's, it cannot be overstated. Um, and on that note, um, you know, besides what we've been sort of pre presupposing communication in a sort of a utilitarian way, mm -hmm. but of course there's things like poetry, you know, there are other ways we express ourselves in a, um, beyond just sort of the transmittal of information. So I guess that's a question for you. Does in your work and people you've worked with, have you seen folks who have different modes of communication not only take on their own rehabilitation uh, in this sort of utilitarian way, but to then also create, uh, get creative, poetic, have you seen sort of alternative means of poetry, for example? Does that ever come up? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I will say that, uh, you know, we, we express ourselves in, in so many different ways, right? So, you know, some patients that come to mind, for instance, um, I have had patients who have been able to do really um, incredible digital art. Mm -hmm. uh, let's say by uh, working with uh, software that allows them to control the computer with their eyes, or also others who have who have composed wonderful music mm -hmm. uh, using similar ways of interacting with the computer. 
Mm -hmm. um, you know, it, a lot. There's some work that I do that's involved with um, preserving your voice for future use. There's this this process called voice banking. Mm -hmm. um, and when we think about some of the things that we might preserve uh, when we're doing voice and message banking, uh, that goes well beyond the functional things that you might think about, the, the thank yous or please get me a towel, please get me a drink of water. You know, the things that, that really are going to be so meaningful end up being things like the sound of somebody's laugh. Mm -hmm. um, the, these, these very kind of nonverbal, non-utilitarian ways of expressing ourselves um, that, that, that carry so much meaning. For sort of the simple joy and the profound joy of just expressing, period. I mean, it doesn't need to be a means to some end. It can be the means and the end can be the same thing. It can be a, a pleasure in expression or a poignancy in expression. Yeah. And it sounds like from what you're saying, that doesn't need to be off the table just because we may, we may struggle to form words per se. Um, yeah, interesting. I'll, I wonder, I'll, we'll search around. I wonder if there are any folks out there in the world holding their hands up as artists who work in this way. It sounds like there are. It sounds like you've bumped into them. I'd be fascinated to, to look into that further. Um, okay, well, beautiful, beautiful. Um, Anything more to say about preparing, whether you, you're, you are the person who is struggling to communicate or your loved one is, or someone you work for or with, anything more to say on the preparing piece? I will say that it's, it's really important to, to think about uh, these kinds of often difficult, important conversations maybe that you might want to have in advance of, a crisis or an emergency situation, um, because often that's when there's lots of opportunities for miscommunication. Mm. So, you know, I imagine that a lot of the listeners today are, are already kind of well-versed in thinking about um, big picture issues that they might be discussing around chronic conditions that they, they're dealing with. Um, but it's so important to be having these conversations in contexts where you're comfortable and there's little pressure um, so that you're able to communicate more effectively exactly what your needs and wants might be. Um, in those kind of crisis situations, let's say when somebody's hospitalized, you might be dealing with an intubation, uh, they might be acutely confused, you're, you're in a busy kind of setting with, with providers who don't know you as well. Um, you know, all of these things make communicating that much more challenging and difficult. Um, so as much as we can talk about having those hard conversations maybe on a more regular basis in more comfortable situations that can help us to, to be prepared and, and be on the same page. Beautiful. Well, okay. Well, um, we should cut over to questions, guys. That went quickly. Um, let me, um, <laughs> it's a beautiful shot. Um, <laughs> I think we've probably, anything more you want to say about your field? I think we maybe have covered that. that yeah, insane. yeah. I think so too. Okay. Beautiful, Patricia. All right, I'm going to pull us out of here. Sonia, what's going on on the chat or Q&A front? Yeah, we've had a few things come in. Um, one person said, what are what about emotional content um, on the topic of communication or fear? Um, so that what we sh what should be discussed is maybe not brought up in that moment. Can you can you clarify a little bit the question? Yeah, I think it's just about thinking about the emotional aspect of communication, so or emotional content of uh, communication or fear, so that what should be discussed is maybe danced around or not brought up. So it might just be more, BJ, this might be more for you. Um, mm -hmm. I guess she's saying a serious illness conversation. So, yeah, I mean, well, like we've set, touched on a little bit here, fear, anxiety, super normal stuff in the context we're talking about uh, happens all the time. I mean, those are very normal phenomena and especially charged uh, in, you know, in the se setting of serious illness and especially charged if there's some really important decisions on the line. Um, 
And so again, seeing beyond just the conveyance of uh, the sort of utilitarian view of language, because that that emotion, very normal, very real, both can affect and hinder our, our ability to communicate. And uh, if we're not able to convey that emotion, the people listening to us may not really necessarily get a sense of just how important something is to us, or they may miss the point if that emotional uh, sort of context isn't conveyed. So there's a lot hanging on the line there. So what my response, from, from, my, from my point of view, uh, the, the response there is part of the answer is some sort of s advocacy saying, finding a way to say in this busy hospital environment or whatever it is saying, hey, there's something really important here. I need you to listen or I need, I need some space around this. And I'm, that's easy for me to say sitting here, but how does one do that? Well, some of that, as Patricia said, is around planning. If you know you're walking into a difficult situation or, you know, then maybe priming the pump, writing your questions down, however, you know, kind of preparing in that way. But in real time, oftentimes we're left to improvise, of course. And so this gets back to, for my money, gets back to us finding our way to embodying our situation so that we can not so that we can command it, but so we can do what we need to to get what we need. Um, so, uh, there's no shame in that anxiety. There's no shame in that fear, but finding a way, whether it's yourself or a family member to note it. So people in the room, listen, sometimes you need to shake people. Sometimes you need to simply close the door. Sometimes you need to simply, simply to sit at that doctor or anyone else. Hey, I, 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 I'm worried that this isn't getting through. I really need you to hear this. So some of that is that I, I hear that question and it points me back to sort of an advocacy and activism. And that points me to somehow getting us all to embodying our situations as different as they may be. Um, Cause the last, when we're with our differences, the rest of the world that isn't always wired for us can blow past us uh, far too easily. Sometimes you have to interrupt it. Um, but does that answer the question guys? I'm, or am I off on a whole other jag? I, it looks like you did. I mean, I'm wondering if we can also add to it, like what to do when you try to bring up a tough um, topic and it's just kind of shut down by the other person, you know, what are some mm. Uh, mm. techniques or things to think about in that situation? I, I will say that a common experience that I have is uh, when there is a tough topic and that the other person is not ready to discuss yet. Um, so I think that that something that can be helpful is is maybe tuning into that other person about their readiness to hear uh, and readiness to engage about that particular topic. You know, sometimes we we can't avoid it forever, and sometimes the reality of the situation is is that that we're we're forced to have that difficult conversation. Uh, but sometimes, if we've got a little bit of room, you know, of flexibility with timing, you know, waiting for that other person to be more ready uh, might prime them to be in a space where where the conversation will be more fruitful. And I think it's true too, just to. No, difficult conversations are, and I don't mean this in a cute way, are difficult yeah. and they're clunky mm -hmm. and they're awkward, no matter even in the best of circumstances, let alone when you have challenges around transmitting information. So all the more reason to prime the pump, all the more reason to shut that door, all the more reason to tackle the doctor and say, hey, this is, <laughs> but I, I mean this, this is something important to me, whatever it is, kind of elbow out that space. Again, super easy for me to say that sitting here. But one way or another, that's what needs to happen. And if what's keeping you, whether you're the person trying to communicate or the person trying to listen, if what you know, if what's keeping, you know, if what's getting in the way of that uh, is awkwardness or clunkiness or fear, well, best you can own that too. It doesn't mean that there's still not a very important point to communicate. And again, just because it feels awkward or frightful, uh, that's no reason to stop. It is often some of the most serious conversations I've ever been in are just inherently awkward, period. So don't let awkwardness deter you. Again, easy for me to say, um, but this is where being, living with illness or loving someone who is, it is, there's, a, there's an advocacy piece that we just can't get away from.
Um, it's just so important. So mm-hmm. um, I, hopefully there's an answer for, for our listener in there. Um, Sonia, what do you think? Shall we move on? Yeah, so we've got two more questions. Patricia, are you okay to go just a couple minutes over if we, sure. okay, great, thank okay. you. So thank this you. other one said, this other person said, what should I do if I believe my doctor isn't hearing my concerns? I can jump in there. I mean, I think if they have the wherewithal and the presence in the moment to, you know, to really sort of try to cut the doctors move, hospitals move on momentum. There is so much going on, as Patricia mm-hmm. mentioned earlier. And you can have all the compassion in the world for your doctor and all that stuff, because it is tough, blah, 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 blah. But this is your life. This is your care. Um, and sometimes you just need to break through the din. Um, and if raising your voice is impossible, if moving your hand is impossible, is shutting the door is impossible, finding some way to let that doctor know um, and sometimes that can happen and sometimes it doesn't. I was recently a patient myself and I know these things and I found myself feeling really helpless in an ER and struggling to speak up for myself and I don't have communication challenges per se. So again, I don't be Pollyannish here, but one thing, one trick can be if you know that the doctor is struggling with this subject, isn't hearing you, uh, a preemptive email before the visit or a note saying, I want to talk about X, Y, or Z, no matter what else, I really need to get to this. Try to keep it to two or three things, not 10, uh, or maybe schedule multiple visits if you know it's complicated. Um, But if you can presage it with an email or a note, that's great. Um, Or if just the visit comes and goes and you just didn't get what you need, follow up with an email and say, hey, good to see you, blah, 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 but we didn't touch this, and can we schedule more time, or can we get on the phone, or whatever it may be, but it's, uh, I guess my point here is you need to be a little bit relentless when it's, when you know it's really important information for you, and don't let the doctor's response deter you, because again, they're on too, they're working on too many planes on momentum, and you just need to disrupt that momentum one way or another. Okay, great. And then this last question, um, this person said, my mother was recently diagnosed with Alzheimer's. I know that there can be language issues over time just um, to confusion. And I'm wondering if you have any suggestions for what to look out for and think about future communication with her, both for myself and my family. Um, Do you have any suggestions for for working with someone who has Alzheimer's or caring for someone who has Alzheimer's? Uh, I will say uh, for anyone dealing with thinking changes, something that can be helpful for all of us is routines. So routines in our day-to-day schedule, uh, routines in our environment and the way that we're managing that, uh, that's going to help to give us all kind of predictable expectations as to what's going on through the day um, and hopefully help to reduce the amount of situations that we're encountering where we need to negotiate communication or, or where there's more risks of breakdowns there. Um, another thing to consider with, with Alzheimer's or, or people dealing with advanced dementia in particular is, is how much of what we communicate can really be nonverbal. You know, we offer, we can offer so much comfort and support and connection in ways beyond the words, you know, our tone of voice, our facial expressions, physical affection, um, sharing in music, um, all of these are, are really wonderful ways to connect, even if, uh, if language or thinking might be impacting our ability to, to engage in, in a conversation as we might traditionally expect that to go. I love that last note, Patricia, thank you. There's so much that happens non-verbally. Uh, and I think just also with the, when it's a loved one and, you know, for lack of a better word, a vibe is another way to communicate. Yes. <laughs> just get a sense for, because you know the person so well, mm-hmm. or maybe that grimace is just sort of lingered on their face a little longer than usual, or mm-hmm. maybe their eyes are darting around, whatever it may be. Um, use that gut sense, uh, that connection that's already in place with your loved one to kind of get a best guess at a feeling of what's going on in there. Um, we know that folks who are living with Alzheimer's, it's very easy to blow past things like pain or other symptoms that they can't tell you about. So looking an eye, keeping an eye out for fidgetiness mm-hmm. or sustained grimace mm-hmm. or crying out, of course, 
Um, but really tuning in, and I love that word, it's an attunement issue. You're tuning in in a sort of a subtle and exquisite and a bodily way and a vibe way, an aesthetic way. Uh, that's a, where a lot of the action is when we're no longer in command of our words. Um, but again, it's another note underneath our note here all day today. There are other ways we communicate. So it's a matter of in so many ways of attunement. Um, so, all right. Well, thank you, Patricia, for going over. And thanks just for being here with us. That was oh, so nice. Awesome. <laughs> it was yeah. really wonderful. Yeah. So thank you. And thanks for everyone who joined us. Hope everyone has a great weekend. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, guys. Thank you, Patricia. All right. You guys have a great weekend. You too. Bye, everybody. <laughs>